Welcome back to Cheddar, everyone. We're down here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and Morgan Stanley shares down about 2% this morning in early trading after disappointing earnings before the bell. The stock really taking it on the chin here, and we're joined now by David Bonson, founder of Bonson Group. Uh, David, great to have you with us. Um, not good for Morgan Stanley. No, and I think it's actually worse than people are sort of talking about because the stock's dropping because of the fixed income trading. We expected it was going to be lower. Goldman sort of outperformed what people had thought was going to happen, but J.P. Morgan also had a similar story, as did Citi a few days ago. But Morgan's wealth management revenues were about $400 million under expectation. That's supposed to be the kind of uh, uh, stabilizing force in their revenue model. Um, I think they're so highly dependent on credit line spreads. As interest rates go higher, it just really seemed to tear into their EBITDA. It's so interesting that they, Morgan Stanley, invested heavily in wealth management over the years, where we had heard at the same time other Wall Street banks and firms were scaling back wealth management and trying to use AI to make a lot of these recommendations. Well, in full disclosure, I was managing director at Morgan Stanley when a lot of that was happening, and I think that what you described with the other firms scaling back was much more by necessity than desire. Citigroup was insolvent, and so they sold Smith Barney to Morgan Stanley. Uh, Merrill Lynch, obviously, falling into Bank of America. Those were sort of financial crisis-related events. Uh, wealth management is a very annuitized revenue business. It was a great strategic decision that James Gorman made to drive them into that business. But right now, they're highly dependent on spread, meaning they give credit lines to clients. They generate a spread between their cost of money and what the clients are paying. Interest rates are rising. Asset prices have had nine years of going higher, so that model becomes somewhat vulnerable. And I'm glad you mentioned the interest rates because they're the one, we thought the banks with the Fed raising interest rates were the one group that were loving <laughs> the Fed raising these interest rates. Why is that? Why did that not help them? Like but, but the it, didn't of it didn't happen, and that's the thing is the thesis wasn't wrong, but the yield curve flattened. So the whole issue that you're describing is net interest margin, that if the rates all go up in tandem, the banks more, make more money. But the spread between the short end and the long end didn't go higher. It went way more flat. And so that flatter yield curve took away net interest margin from the banks. So the um, expectation that that would happen may have been wrong, but how it would have played out if it had surfaced that way was not wrong at all. It was a rough year for the banks. Obviously, the fourth quarter of last year, extremely rough with all of that volatility in January. What does 2019 look like for these banks? A lot of it depends on macroeconomic conditions. I think that if loan growth continues, some of the regional banks we own reported this morning, BB&T is one, and they had um, positive loan growth even in fourth quarter, which was a little surprising. Um, look, the, the models are somewhat stable now in sort of a post-Dodd-Frank era. I don't think you're going to have big balance sheet risk. J.P. Morgan's numbers were very good on the quarter other than that fixed income trading that fell off. Investment banking revenues were way higher than expected. So we like the banks overall, but we're not um, top down. We want to pick individual names. For us, BBT is one in the regional and J.P. Morgan on the big banks. But uh, J uh, Jamie Dimon did bring the alarms the other day saying if this government shutdown continues, this is going to not just hurt the economy, this could also hurt the banking industry as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I didn't read him as saying that he was ringing the alarms. He was describing a linear conclusion if indeed something plays out multiple months. And he was really just doing math for us. He was saying it's an input into GDP. Government spending is an input into GDP. If that comes out, it's going to bring GDP down. But, but, but let's just say this government shutdown continues. I mean, we're 27 days into it, and we have no idea when this is and going to what's the market end. done in that period of time? Yes, it has, but let's just say this continues into February. Is yeah. banking going to be the one sector that's going to get hit the hardest? I, I don't think so. I think it would end up being consumer spending if that were to happen, but it's really difficult to sort of forecast something that doesn't have a precedent. We have about nine government shutdowns. The market was up in nine out of nine of them. 100% of the time. Now, this is going to go longer, but it's also only 25% of the government shut down. The other ones were 100%. There's just a big difference. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's, I don't really have an outlook on it because no one knows how it's going to end. Well, the but, first time we might see it show up in the data, right, is when we get the jobs report because... Well, we can't get a jobs report until they end. The right, government. right. But eventually we will get a jobs report. 800,000 people furloughed or not working because of the shutdown. Yeah, so what would that do to the economy overall? You're saying the jobs report has an artificial print lower, it ends up with an artificial print higher the next quarter. Um, the market's way too smart to get fooled the by The Trump administration like itself just recently doubled its projections, right? 0.13 percentage points. It's expected to shave off of GDP as the shutdown 
Correct. does persist. That's right. Let's talk about Jamie Dimon. I was actually at his. Uh, but by the way, just real speech. quick to that point, that one point through that point one three percent then comes back in in the next quarter, just by, by math. So Jamie Dimon said yesterday, for instance, right? There are a lot of different theories out there. Obviously, the figures that we just cited coming directly from the Trump administration itself, and presumably one would hope that that would lead to a rebound later on, but only half of these federal workers are going to be paid retroactively. When I was at the talk that he was giving um, yesterday, I thought one of the interesting points was that he said it seems as if the business community has come around to this trade war and the thesis that President Trump is weighing against China. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? That the business community is supportive of the that trade war? That the business war? community is now supportive of Trump trying to take a hard line against China when it comes to trade, and particularly oh, that, yeah, IP theft. that's a great point. Theft. I, I, with IP theft, that's exactly what I was going to say, is it's very bifurcated. The business community is overwhelmingly against the idea of taxing U.S. importers and indirectly taxing U.S. consumers. But I think that the fact that we may get out of this some resolution around IP theft this forced participation in joint ventures. I think the business community is very supportive of that. The, but the probably larger factor we have to consider is the economic impact it's having on capital expenditures. Business has clearly collapsed their capex later in the year, and there's no possible catalyst to that that I can see other than the trade war. Uh, David, we have less than 40 seconds left. Netflix announcing their uh, their earnings after the bell today. We know they re increased the subscription rates yesterday. The stock did very well. What are you going to be looking forward to into in the earnings report today? Um, we don't care about Netflix. We would never own it. Wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So Why? I guess I'm looking to see if it's going to trade at 180 times earnings or 150 times earnings after the numbers come out. I've never seen a stock drop. 35% in six weeks and still trade over 100 times earnings in my life. But um, Netflix is one that is totally outside of what we would ever touch. Uh, their increase in rates going forward will be good for the revenue model, but they're not going to be able to make sustainable uh, profits anytime soon, and we are profit-driven investors. All right, David Bonson, founder of Bonson Group, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.